Okay, well, as you can see, um, I ended up doing more factorization yesterday with the perfect squares, um, turning them into binomial pairs. I did not check to see if it was recording, um, so I ended up filming the whole or. I thought I was filming the whole thing, um, but after I, you know, exited the window and lo and behold, it wasn't there. Um, but that's okay. We're going to go over the unit test for the last couple days. Um, so let's start on that right now. So let's do a refresh. I'm about to start. All right. Oops. Okay, and I think since it is getting a little late, I'm going to try to complete this whole section and then we'll pick up whenever uh, this is completed. The volume of a rectangular prism. Okay. Pick three expressions that can represent the three dimensions of the prism. Um. Three dimensions. So you have a rectangular. What is it? Prism, like a rectangular. Prism, is that just a cube? Or something that appears like a cube, but it's rectangular? Okay, so I'm guessing it just wants length, uh, length, width, and height. Uh, oh, okay. So it wants binomial pairs, or try. <laughs> Yeah, binomial, not pairs, but it wants three three binomials. Okay, so V for volume is equal to X to the fourth minus Y to the fourth. And we know that the volume is also equal to the length times the width times the height. So let's break down this into V equals X squared squared minus Y squared squared. Is that going to help us? Hmm. Well, maybe not. X squared. Hmm. So it's probably going to be like x squared minus y squared times x squared plus y squared. Let's see how that works out. 
but that's not we need three expressions so that's not going to be good enough so x squared times x squared x to the fourth x squared times y squared plus x squared y squared minus x squared y squared so those will cancel out minus y to the fourth okay so that's it but something's missing what's missing so we got x squared plus y yeah yeah and then nothing else needs need be applied um Oh, what if we did I'm guessing it might be this one that can represent the three dimensions. Uh this is a problem. So Ay, 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 okay. Ow. So we know these two work, but that's not it because that's the end of the line for those. We need a th third one, and we can't multiply by anything else, so it has to be some other. It has to be some other binomials. Okay. X minus Y times X. Plus y. We got x squared um, minus y squared, right? Because the x y's cancel out. So we have that times by oh x squared plus y squared. There we go. Okay. X squared plus y squared. And we have x minus y and x plus y. Perfect. Okay. To factor the polynomial. Okay. Three x to the third minus twelve x squared plus nine x. So the coefficient three. Um, normally we'd have to solve this by grouping, I believe. Oh, does it want us to do grouping? Yes, it does. Dang it! I was gonna say we could just divide three since they're all multiples of three. 12 and 9, but it looks like it wants to do grouping, so let's try to do that. Um, so we got 3x to the third minus 3x squared minus 9x squared plus 9x. Yeah. Wow. 
minus. This is a minus, and that's a plus. I can pull out a th 3x. I get x minus 1. Pull out a 9x. And we get x plus 1. Nope. Dang it. What's going on here? Pull out a 3. All right, let's redo this. So we have 3x cubed minus 3x squared minus 9x squared plus 9x. Three x equals x minus one. Three x squared. Pulling out three x squared is x minus one. Pulling out x. Pulling out nine x. Is negative one x plus one. Pulling out the negative one, we get three x squared x minus one minus nine x x minus one, and we get three x squared minus nine x x minus one times x minus one, and then we could pull out a three x from the Front multiplicand. So we get 3x, x minus 3 times x minus 1. Who is right? Javier is right. Only Javier. Okay, which monomials are divisible by? Well, I mean, uh, technically, can't they both be divisible? Like, what does it mean by divisible that they both can be divided by this? Right, 6 can go into both of those. Well, this twice, that four times. This can go... You'll get a remain uh, going, it goes into once, and you, you're left with y, one y, and it can go into that half of a time. I don't know, I think they're just looking for that. If I get it wrong, it's gonna be because of that. Oh, well, okay. It wants to know how many full times factor as a product of two binomials. Okay. How was I doing this before I did the groupings? Hmm. It's negative twenty four. What it multiplies to. And then it adds to 5. So it could be 6 and f 6 and 4 don't make it. It's probably 8 and 3. Yep, yeah, 8 and negative 3. So x squared minus 3x plus 8x minus 24. x 
uh, x minus 3 and plot a positive 8 and it's x minus 3. You get 8 plus x plus 8 and x minus 3. x minus 3, x plus 8. Factor completely. And this is where that grouping comes in. Again, c squared minus 9cd plus 8d squared. Okay. So what about plus one? So C squared plus one or how can I get something to eight? Um So we have negative 8, oh, and negative 1, there we go, so negative 1 CD, negative 1 CD minus 8 CD plus 8 D squared, um, okay. So we have C over C minus C times C minus D. We get pull out a negative eight D eight D and we're left with uh, we're left with C minus D which is c minus 8d times c minus d. Is that factored completely? I think so. It seems like a weird factor, which probably means it's wrong. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, Factor completely. Is that a square of some sort? So, so let's do radical 320. Uh, this is 8 to the fifth. 8 fifth. Or 8 rad 5. Wow, okay. What about 320 divided by 5? Let's pull out the 5s. Uh, 5. So we do 5 times x squared minus 64. Um, and then we can break that up into 2 Um, pair and we can break that into a pair of binomials because um, it, it looks like it's a perfect square because we have x squared minus 8 squared which means we can do 5 times x minus 8 times x plus 8 5 times x minus 8 times x plus 8. The rectangle below has uh -huh, square meters and a length of... Mm -hmm. What's the width? Okay. Well, 
what expression represents a width. So we're looking for a binomial. Okay. So we got our rectangle. Got an area of 11 squared minus x squared, which means it's 11 minus x times 11 plus x. 11 minus x, 11 plus x. Oh my word. Okay. So that's 7 squared. And that's q squared minus 2 squared. Yikes, don't know if I know how to do that. Oh wait, okay, so yeah I do. 7 squared squared minus 2 squared. So we have 7 squared, oh wait, 7 q Wait, <laughs> one sec, seven, Q oh yeah, yeah, okay, let's re rewrite this as, okay, so we have 49 Q to the four, so there's, this is Q to the four, so let's just write seven squared Q to the four minus Two squared. So, in other words, this first term can also be written as seven q squared squared minus two squared, which means seven q squared minus two times. 7q squared plus 2. I think that's right. 7q squared minus 2. 7q squared plus 2. Awesome. Okay. The rectangle below has area blah blah blah. The width of the rectangle in meters is equal to the greatest common denominator. What's the width? What's the height? What's the length? Well, the length is just those two added together. Uh, the width? Wait, the width? <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's. Okay. The rectangle has an area. Oh, it's the area. So no, sorry, that's not the length. Okay. So let's let's break down the area. Fourteen x to the four plus six x squared. Well, I can pull out a two and an x squared. So we have two x, which leaves us seven x squared plus three. Was that helpful? No. <laughs> um, so it's 14. Hmm. So maybe I need to, instead of adding them together, hmm. 
Let's do 14x to the force and try to find. Is it equal to the greatest common monomial factor? The width. Oh, well. 2x squared is the greatest factor. And then 7x squared plus 3 would be the length. 7x squared, I mean, hmm? all right. Oh, OK, cool. Completely factor. Is 75 divided by 3? Yes, because it's 25 divided by 3. Yep, 25. So I'm going to do it that way. I'm just going to get rid of the 3s. So we have three Does pen work. Okay, we have three x squared plus thirty x plus seventy five. All divide them all by threes is x squared plus ten x plus 25. Um, well, we can't just divide them by, divide by threes, we're, we pulled out a three. That's, yeah, we pulled out a three and put it in the front. Okay, so remember that threes out there. Put that in the front. Um, now, what two x's had together Multiply together, oh, five. Ha, huh. okay, so we have x squared plus five x plus five x plus 25. So we have three times this whole thing. And we're pulling out an x and we get x plus five, pulling out a five and we get x plus 5, so we have 3 times x plus 5 squared. 3 times x plus 5 squared. If a plus 7b plus 4c equals 2, what is... Okay, it's like this, right? Well, I don't know. Let's write it in order. So a plus 7b plus 4c equals 2. What is 9a plus 63b plus 36c equal to? Well, 63 divided by 7, that's 9. And 36 divided by 4 is 9. So we just multiplied one side by 9. We multiplied this by 9, so we need to pl multiply that by 9. Times 9, times 9, and we get 18. Factor quadratic completely. Well, right here we can't do that little pull out the three trick. So we're going to need to group. Uh, what would be a good grouping? If we did eight, it would leave us, oh, if we did negative eight, it'd leave us with a negative 10. That's good. Negative eight x minus 10 x minus five, perfect. So group these, group these. Now uh, pull out a eight X, we get X minus one. Pull out a negative, hmm. Hmm. 
that's not going to help us, actually. Is it? We'll pull out a negative 5. We're left with 2x minus 1. Well. So we need this. I'm thinking this is going to be negative 16. Hmm. What's negative 40? Negative 40 times negative 18. Or what times what? What you get this 40. 40 divided by 10. Four and no, it's not gonna work. Forty divided by six. No, nope. forty divided by eight. Eight and five. No, forty divided by. No, forty divided by twenty. Forty divided by ten. No. Wait, this is not gonna work out. Why do I keep running into the problem with this one? These types. What is it that I'm not getting? Um. Let's see. the quadrant oh. thirteen. I'm missing something here. So what if I did 8x squared minus 16x, mm, wait a second, minus 24, so if I did negative 24 plus 8, negative 24 plus 6. Something's not working now. Minus 2x minus 5. So 8x, x minus 2. Minus 2x minus 5. Ugh. There's no perfect squares. Just going to put zero so I can get the hint. Try grouping factor contracts by grouping. I tried that. Yeah, tried that.
but a plus b equals b n yeah yeah true terms oh my god why is it every single time <laughs> something so simple okay so it's Jesus 20 negative 20 and 2 so we have 8x squared minus uh, or plus 2x minus 20x minus 5 group 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 2x geez 4x plus 1 minus 5 is 4x plus 1 so we get 2x minus 5 4x plus 1 it's just that you gotta see it there's no other you know what what I gotta start doing is making a table so you get you got negative 40 right you got negative 40 and you got two numbers a and b that it can be right and you gotta start with 1 negative 40 2 negative 20 or you could just even put the negatives off to the side just do the whole numbers negative 40 divisible by 3? Nope, so it's not 3. 40 divisible by 4? Yep, it's 10. Wow, okay. Just good doing that from now on because somehow I'm always skipping. Skipping numbers. Jeez. 4x plus 1. There we go. Alright. Alright, alright. Let's see. Got x squared plus 4x plus 4. Well, what can you multiply to get 4? And you add them together and you get 4. 2 and 2. x squared plus 2x plus 2x plus 4 x and you get an x plus 2 and you pull out a 2 positive 2 and you get an x plus 2 and you get an x plus 2 squared side length x plus 2 what is the greatest common factor I don't know let's write it out so we got 63 b squared c to the fourth and we have 42 b3 c squared so they both have in common a b squared they both have in common a c squared now what's the biggest factor to pull out of 63 and 42 is it 9? Nope. 63 divided by 7. 42 divided by 7. There we go. 7. B squared C squared. 7 B squared C Oops, squared. Oh, it's not 7. What is it? 14? 63 divide 63 divided by 14 63 divided by oh it's gonna be 21 huh 42 divided by 21 dang it sloppy sloppy work okay let's do so we need the other binomial x squared plus 13x plus 36 well 
what multiplies to get 36 and adds to get 13. Let's do that. We know one of the numbers is 9, right? Since this is one of the sides. So that makes it easy, actually, because we just do 36 divided by 9. And we'll get, oops, 36 divided by 9 to get the other answer. That's x plus 4 times x plus 9 gives us that answer. So it's x plus 4. So that's a real easy way. If you already have 1, you just divide it. Get the answer. Find the missing factor. Well, it's 2. X. Y. Shooting from the hip there. <laughs> All right, and we know what these mistakes are now. So. Let's do this 36 one for fun. Let's pretend we didn't know that 9, right? So draw 36 at the top. It's positive, so we don't have to worry about the negatives. we got a column for A and B. So column A, doesn't matter, right? We can interchange if they're interchangeable. 36. Two. And 18, 3 and 12, 4 and 9, and there we go. And now 5s, but 6s work, 6 and 6. And then we start to go in the other direction, right? So, yeah, we would just go back. Uh, once we eat, we have an equality on both sides, it just will go backwards, so. All right, what's up next for, oh, quadratics. More quadratics, or? Let's watch this, just, uh, oh, we should watch the, I should watch the intros more often. In this video, we are going to talk about one of the most common types of curves you will see in mathematics, and that is the parabola. And the word parabola sounds quite Oh. Oh no. In this video, we are going to talk about one of the most common types of curves you will see in mathematics, and that is the parabola. And the word parabola sounds quite fancy, but we'll see it's describing something that is fairly straightforward. Now, in terms of why it is called the parabola, I've seen multiple explanations for it. It comes from Greek para, that root word, similar to parable, you could view of something beside, alongside, something in parallel. Bola, same root as when we're talking about ballistics, throwing something. So you could interpret it as beside, alongside, something that is being thrown. Now, how does that relate to curves like this? Well, my brain immediately imagines, well, this is the trajectory, this is the path that is a pretty good approximation for the path of things that are actually thrown. And when you study physics, you will see the path, you will approximate the path of objects being thrown as parabolas. So maybe that's where it comes from. But there are other potential explanations for why it is actually called the parabola. It has been lost to history. But what exactly is a parabola? In future videos, we're gonna describe it a little bit more algebraically. In this one, we just want to get a sense for what parabolas look like and introduce ourselves to some terminology, terminology around a parabola. So these three curves, they are all hand-drawn versions of a parabola. And so you immediately notice some interesting things about them. Some of them are open upwards, like this yellow one and this pink one, and some of them are open downwards. And you will hear people say things like open, open down, open downwards, or open down, or open upwards. So it's good to know what they're talking about. And it's hopefully fairly self-explanatory. Open upwards, the, the, parab the parabola is open towards the top of our graph paper. Here it's open towards the bottom of our graph paper. This is, looks like a right side up view. This looks like an upside down view right up here. This pink one would be open upwards. 
Now, another term that you'll see associated with a parabola, and once again, in the future, we'll learn how to calculate these things and find them precisely, is the vertex. And the vertex you should view as the maximum or minimum point on a parabola. So if a parabola opens upwards, like these two on the right, the vertex is the minimum point. The vertex is the minimum point right over there. And so if someone said, what is the vertex of this yellow parabola? Well, it looks like the x looks like the x coordinate is three and a half. So it is three and a half. It looks like the y coordinate, it looks like it is about negative three and a half. And once again, once we start representing these things with equations, we'll have techniques for calculating them more precisely. But the vertex of this other upward opening parabola, it is the minimum point. It is the low point. There is no maximum point on an upward opening parabola. It just keeps increasing as x gets larger in the positive or the negative direction. Now, if your parabola opens downward, then your vertex is going to be your maximum point. Now, related to the idea of a vertex is the idea of an axis of symmetry. And in general, when we're talking about, well, not just three, two dimensions, but even three dimensions, but especially in two dimensions, you can imagine a line over which you can flip the, the, you can flip the graph and so it meets, it folds on to itself. And so the axis of symmetry for this yellow graph right over here, for this yellow parabola, it would be this line. I should draw it a little bit better. It would be, it would be that line right over there. You could fold the parabola over that line and it would meet itself. And that line, I didn't draw it as neat as I should, that should go directly through the vertex. So to describe that line, you'd say that line is x is equal to 3.5. Similarly, the axis of symmetry for this pink parabola, it should go through the line x equals negative 1. You can do that. That's the axis of symmetry. It goes through the vertex. And if you were to fold the parabola over it, it would meet itself. The axis of symmetry for this green one, it should once again go through the vertex. It looks like it is x is equal to negative 6. This is, let me write that down, that is the axis of symmetry. Now another concept that isn't unique to parabolas, but we'll talk a lot about it in the context of parabolas, are intercepts. So when people say why intercept, and you saw this when you first graph lines, they're saying where does the graph, where does the curve intercept or intersect the y-axis? So the y-intercept of this yellow line would be right there. It looks like it's the point 0, 3. 0, 3. The y-intercept for the pink one is right over there. We At least on this graph paper, we don't see the y-intercept, but it eventually will intersect the y-axis. It just will be way off of this screen. Now, you might also be familiar with the term x-intercept, and that's especially interesting with parabolas, as we'll see in the future. X-intercept is where you intercept or intersect the x-axis. And here, this yellow one, you see it does it two places. And this is where it gets interesting. Lines will only intersect the x-axis once, but at most. But here, we see that a parabola can intersect the x-axis twice, because it curves back around to intersect it again. And so for here, the x-intercepts are going to be the point mm. 1, comma, 0, mm, and 6, six comma, 0. Now, you might already notice something interesting the x-intercepts are symmetric around the axis of symmetry. So they should be equal distant from so that axis of symmetry. And you can see they indeed the are. Two. They're both exactly two and a half away from that axis of symmetry. And so if you know where the intercepts are, you just take, you could say, the midpoint of the x-coordinates, and then you're going to have the axis of symmetry, the x-coordinate of the axis of symmetry, and the x-coordinate of the actual vertex. Similarly, the x-intercepts here looks like it's negative, the points are negative 7, comma, 0, and negative 5, comma, 0. And the x-coordinate of the vertex, or the line of symmetry, is right in between those two points. Now, it's worth noting, not every parabola is going to intersect the x-axis. Notice, this pink upward opening parabola, its low point is above the x-axis. So it's never going to intersect the actual x-axis. So this is actually not going to have any x-intercepts. Hmm. So I'll leave you there. Those are actually the core ideas or the core visual themes around parabolas. And we're going to discuss them in a lot more detail when we represent them with equations. And as you'll see, these equations are going to involve second-degree terms. So the, the most simple parabola is going to be y is equal to x squared. But then you can complicate it a little bit. You could have things like y is equal to 2x squared minus 5x plus 7. These types, and we'll talk about in more general terms, these types of equations, sometimes called quadratics, they are represented generally by parabolas. OK. With that, I think I'm going to close out for today. Uh, let's refresh this. See if we put in enough time. Hoping it's above average. Yeah, we put, we've been, okay, these were weak. Okay, we need to get back up to this level. <laughs> All right, so tomorrow we'll do more of those. Uh, quadratics, the parabolas, um, 